So I want to jump right in this morning, picking up in verse 10. Uh, our, our starting point is verse 14, but I, got, I want to get a running start to verse 14. So I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you. And again, I will put my trust in him, and again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. This is our starting verse for this morning's study, verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had power of death, that is, the devil. Now, I do not believe that what this verse is saying to us is that Satan has the power to kill a man. That, that would be, I believe, an inappropriate interpretation of what is being said here. Job 14.5 reads, Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. The Lord holds the days of every man in his hands. It is, it is God's determination. It is by God's authority that you live, and it is by God's determination that your days end. Satan doesn't have the power to kill a man. Uh, that is in the hands of God. No, I think this is actually saying the very same thing that we read in Romans chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 12. And then we'll skip down to 17 uh, and, and through verse 21. And I want to read that for you. Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Skipping down to verse 17. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord." Now, do you remember the account of John? Shortly after he was caught up into the heavenlies in Revelation. Do you remember the account? It was starting shortly after the picture of the rapture where John is pulled up. Revelation chapter 5, verse 2 we read, Who is worthy? This is a strong angel crying out. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it, so I wept. That's John. John, John realizing the situation, John starts to, to weep because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Verse 5, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Now, what was taking place there? Why was John weeping? Why was John, why was this such a big deal? 
Because that was the title deed to the earth in the hands of that strong angel. If no one was able to open and loose those seals, man would forever be trapped in the situation of sin, death, and Satan's rule. We would be trapped in this kingdom of sin, which is now controlled by Satan. Through one man, sin entered the world, and with sin, death spread to all men. You see, the power that Satan holds is the dominion that we handed to him at the fall. That's the power that he holds. Our verse here, but he, that is Jesus, himself likewise shared in the same, that is, true humanity, that through death, his death on the cross, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is sin, says that is the devil. Now, the death spoken of here in Hebrews 14, I believe, is the separation from God the Father that is caused by sin. Man is born separated from his maker by sin. This is the doctrine of the depravity of man. When we are born, we are born into a place of separation because we are born into sin. God told Adam in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2, verse 17, he said, eat of every tree you want. All of this, eat of it, but that one tree. Man, when you eat of that tree, I'll kill you, or it will kill you, pardon me. That tree will kill you. <laughs> I'll kill you. It's like, <laughs> that's not what it reads. In the day you eat of that, you will die. That tree's going to kill you. Don't eat of that tree. But the literal translation of that is, in dying, you shall die, as noted by Adam Clark and many other commentaries. In dying, you shall die. That is, there will be a spiritual death, and then what follows is mortality. You are going to, uh, this sin is going to separate you from me, because God is a holy God and must deal with sin. And sin separates us from him. And that is what happened in the garden. In dying you shall die. The wages of sin is death. In dying you shall die. There was spiritual death followed by the beginning of mortality or physical death. Sin has separated us from God. It has separated us from our maker. But Jesus, the second Adam, through his substitutionary death, that is, in our place, has brought life and conquered the power of death. Conquered it. But God told Adam, in dying you shall die. See, sin brought death, as we've said, in two ways. The first way is separation from the Father. Jesus says that life is fellowship or connection with the Father. That is what eternal life is. That is what life is. That is why when you are born, you are born dead. I get a kick out of the whole topic of zombies, which has died, or died down a little bit, but man, there was a season there where like, that's all you heard about in TV shows and movies and everything was zombies, the walking dead. And it's very interesting to me because, well, everybody is born the walking dead. You're walking around like you're alive. You're doing things like you're really living, but you are dead. Because unless you are connected to the Father in fellowship, you are, that separation is death because he is life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, a truth, and a life. He is the way, the truth, and 
the life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. If you don't know the Father, you are not living. And Satan holds this dominion, this, this power over the world that would have trapped us in this place of continual sin and death. That is the power he has over death by trapping man in this place. In dying you shall die. In dying, in, in, in separation spiritually, mortality began. I do think that something changed in man at that point and, and, and the clock started ticking and death started coming. First, we are separated from the Father. And you know, the statistics are staggering 100 out of 100 people die. You, bore, you, you are born headed to your death. That's the truth. 100 out of 100. No one's ever escaped it except, well, one. Right, he died, but death could not keep him. The result of sin is the current condition of every unredeemed person. Listen, that is, every person born into this world starts in this condition of death. That is the starting point for every person. No one is born redeemed. You must become redeemed. You must get redeemed, right? Every single person is born into this condition of death. The, the way verse 14 speaks of spiritual death that has that loomed over every man. Verse 15 speaks of the mortality of man. The mortality of man. Hebrews 2.15. Actually, I should probably read it all together. He himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, verse 15, and release them, or release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The fear of death rules as a tyrant over humanity. Some try to make peace with death by calling it their friend. But Christians, Christians have no fear of death, uh, though perhaps the fear of dying. I, I don't know anyone who's like, I'm looking forward to the process. I, I'm not personally looking forward to the, you know, we all like, we want to be just, I don't know, maybe you, you're not this way. I want to go quick and painless, right? That would be my, I actually want to be raptured, right? I want to be raptured. That's what I want to be. But if I'm not going to be raptured, maybe a fantastic explosion, Right? I mean, instant, you know, just, and I'm talking big. Nobody else is hurt, you know, it's in the desert somehow, and I'm all alone, and, but if the cameras are on it, so they see this, boom, you know, and I'm gone. It's probably not how it's going to go. So no one is looking to this process of death, but because, uh, but not because death is our friend, but because it has been defeated, right? It has been defeated the enemy has been defeated. And now we serve God and we walk in life and we're not afraid of what comes. As a matter of fact, death becomes an agent to bring us to the goodness of God. To bring us to him. Not that we look forward to it and, and we shouldn't have that attitude. You know, God gave us a, a uh, self-preserving uh, uh, attitude, which is a helpful thing. You shouldn't tempt the Lord. You know, don't, don't jump off the building like, hey, I'm just going to break some legs and suffer through it. You know what I mean? If it's not your time, you're not going. No, that's not the, but I'm not afraid of it. But apart from Jesus, apart from Jesus, man is in absolute bondage to sin, to Satan, and to death. Let me say that again. And I want you to really hear it. Apart from Jesus, 
every single person is in bondage, enslaved to sin, to Satan, and to death. That's their reality. Whether they recognize it, whether they know it, whether they believe it, whether they've ever thought of it, that's their reality in absolute bondage. And Jesus came and released those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Death looms over all of humanity. The fear and bondage of our situation seems unescapable. And that is the reality. Do not let anyone fool you. People who don't know Jesus, who tell you they're not afraid of death, they are lying to you. They're lying to you. Because when death comes knocking, that attitude changes. Now I have had the pleasure of watching some beautiful saints walk that road, that valley of the shadow of death, and prove their trust in Christ without, they have no fear. They walk it with boldness and with grace and with joy. And it is such a testimony of Christ when you see that. But that is not the case of the unbeliever, of the unredeemed, of the unregenerated. Those who have not trusted Christ for their salvation, they are in bondage to it. And that is the reality of the situation. And if you are acting like you're not, you're fooling yourself. And if they're telling you they're not, they're just lying to you. Don't believe them. You know, old-time preachers used to talk about death all the time, and we've gotten away from it at the pulpits. We don't talk about it much. Maybe the modern medical age has, you know, dulled our sensitivity to the reality because we're not losing people as quickly and as often as we used to. You can just go to the doctors and get that taken care of. Death is still looming over all of humanity. Don't fool yourself and don't let anyone fool you. Death apart from Jesus is a terrifying prospect. And it should be. If you go into eternity without Jesus, you have one destination ahead of you, and that is eternal damnation. That is the reality. I don't like that reality, but that is the reality. If you go into death without Christ, you're going to hell. And it's forever. And you deserve it. But Christ, but Jesus, doesn't want any man to go there. And so he paid the penalty. It is a terrifying prospect, death without Christ, and it should be. And people today, they medicate to escape it through drugs and both prescription and non-prescription. They medicate to escape it. They look for distraction to ignore it, keeping oneself very busy. I'm going to do this and that and this and that, and I'm going to stay so busy that I have no time to think of my mortality and my future judgment. They cling to false beliefs to feel okay about it. Well, I'm just not going to believe in heaven and hell and judgment. When we die, we die, and there's nothing there. False. Wrong. Well, if I do good enough in this life, if I just do more good than bad, then, you know, whatever God there is, he'll be fair with me, and he'll give me, a, you know, what I deserve. Yes, he will give you what you deserve, but not the way you think it. That's false. People put their trust in science to cure them of the disease of death. That is not my words. Those are the words of transhumanist scientists today, a growing number of academia believing wholeheartedly that one day we will, their words, cure the disease of death. Listen, that's false 
They're not going to do it. Death always comes to collect. It's the sad, unescapable truth of our reality. And that is the bad news. That is the bad news. But the good news, Jesus took upon himself humanity, willingly marched to the cross of Calvary. Never once did he sin. Never once did he ever do anything outside the perfect will of the Father, including the cross, which was the Father's will for him. Upon that cross, the Father placed all the sins of the world, your sins and my sins, every sin that has ever been committed, and he judged Jesus as if he had done it. Even to the point of separation. Jesus died on that cross. He paid the full penalty of sin, but death could not keep him. Death could not hold him. Three days later, he rose from the grave, defeating the power of Satan and the bondage of death for everyone who will believe. That is the good news. When's the last time you heard it preached like that? You need to share that reality with the people you love, with the people God puts into your life. I don't want to see you die without Jesus. I'm not thinking about death. I'm not afraid of death. Yes, you are. Stop lying to me. We, death is reality. You don't know when it's coming. You need Jesus, man, and you need him today. Don't go another minute without him. The, the situation is dire. The urgency is real. The reality is true. It's, it's, it's clear. And the good news is so Good that God values and loves you so much so that he died for you in place of you to give you life. That's the reality of the situation. And it's a wonderful, beautiful truth that needs to be shared, shouted from the mountaintops. Your neighbor that doesn't know Jesus is dying and going to hell. The person at the grocery store that doesn't know Jesus is dying and going to hell. Your family member whom you love that doesn't know Jesus is dying and going to hell. But the good news is they don't have to. They could trust Christ today. If you are in this room and you have not trusted Christ for your salvation, today is the day of salvation. You are on your way to death and hell without him. That is the reality of your situation, and I'm trying to shake you up. Put your trust in Christ today. He loves you. He gave everything for you. Verse 16, for indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. I want to read this for you in a few other translations because it's, it's very interesting. King James Version, that was New King James, which I always teach from if you weren't aware of that. So everything I've been reading is New King James. This is King James. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. That's King James translation. Amplified says this. For as we all know, he, and in parentheses, Christ, did not take hold of angels, in parentheses, the fallen angels, to give them a helping and delivering hand, but he did take hold of the fallen descendants of Abraham to reach out to them a helping and delivering hand. That's amplified, which actually does a phenomenal job of expressing what this verse is really saying. NIV says, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Now, I read all of those to say, one, apparently a difficult verse to translate because there's some really big differences there, and here's why. 
It says what it says, and it has a very big meaning in what it says, right? Like the literal language would be best expressed in the King James Version here. That is actually the most literal of what this says. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. That is the most literal translation. The, the idea that is here is very clear. He took on the nature of man in order to help man, which doesn't help angels, and he didn't take on the nature of angels to help man or angels. That's, that, does that make sense? Did I put that clear? Are, are we catching that? Jesus assumed true and perfect humanity. In order to give help to fallen man, he never became an angel to help angels or man. This is, this is still within the argument that Jesus is so much better than the angels in being a man. And if you read Acts, you can see, in, and if you're, if you're, if you're uh, paying attention to some of the early sermons in Acts, and Bud was reading those this morning, which I was sitting over there going, of course, Lord. Of course he's reading those this morning. There's a real noticeable language that they bring out, the man, the man Christ Jesus. The Jews really struggled with that. They really struggled with that, 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 that a man would be God. They really, really struggled with that. And that's why the earliest heresies attacked the humanity of Christ. But he had to be a man. And him being a man made him so much better than the angels. So that's all part of this conversation. This also answers a question. And if you've never asked this question, and you, if you have children, maybe you've heard this question. And I've heard it from, uh, from new believers. I've heard this question. Could Satan be forgiven if he repented? Have you ever heard that question? I've heard that. Wow, that scared me. <laughs> I've heard that question. I've heard that question. Apparently that question is very scary. The answer is really clear, no. No. First off, Satan will never repent. And if he, you know, did... The sacrifice of Christ did not pay for Satan. It, it, it paid for man. It redeemed man. This is also part of that, that whole, you know, understanding the sacrifice and what it, what it means. And, and really, there's a big topic we talked about last week, the dominion of man. That we are not in that place today, but that is where we were created. Guys, it's the big topic of Man is at the pinnacle of God's creation. We are special. We are separate. We are unique. And, and the, the death on the cross paid for us. Us. Not for Satan. And you can go read, um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to, but you can go read 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 10 to 12, and Job uh, 42, 5, kind of on that topic. And you can study that more. The answer is really simple, no. He did, he did, his death did not was not purposed for and, and does not redeem the fallen angels. They've made their choice. They've made their choice, and, and they're, they're on that road for sure. Verse 17 and 18. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, you and me, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation, that is appeasement, for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Now, it would be very easy to set out in the wrong direction here and start talking about Jesus' ability to help because he understands you. Because he understands you. You know, having suffered temptation himself, he gets you. And so, uh, he can empathize or sympathize with you. It would be easy to move down that direction, and, and quite frankly, I found that to be the larger percentage of commentaries moved down that direction, but that is not taking this in context. That is moving out of context of verse 18. 
The Greek word translated here, uh, tempted, is the same word that is more often found translated test. Test. Now, it's also appropriately translated tempted in places, but it is a much broader word than our word tempted. It's to test. Uh, it means uh, to put to proof, to try the nature or character of, to test or to tempt. Listen, I believe here that what this is saying is Jesus in his humanity was put to the test and, the, and his fitness as our high priest has been proven out so that now he can aid us in the things pertaining to God, right? The propitiation in the things pertaining to God. Th- this, this here is, is contextually connected to him destroying the power of Satan and of hell. Right? We just ran right up into this. I believe the aid spoken of here that Jesus can offer comes from his suffering the test in true humanity and is contextually connected here to his destroying the power of sin and making propitiation for our sins, now making him able and fit to be our merciful and faithful high priest that is in the things pertaining to God. O- okay, what? Pastor, you, you just lost us. Did I lose you? Yeah, a little. I knew I would. I knew I would right there. I'm like, I'm going to lose them right there. Okay, listen. The aid that he is able to offer is not just sympathy or empathy, but power. The aid that he is able to offer you is not just sympathy or empathy. We will talk about that. Chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4, that's brought up. But that is not the context of this here. The context of this here is that he is able to aid, not in sympathy or empathy, that's not what it's talking about, but in power. In Jesus, we are no longer slaves to sin, and we are no longer the enemy of God in Jesus There is victory. It's it's not just a thing uh, for for the future, but it is a present reality. He is able to aid you when you are tempted, not just make you feel good because he gets you. If you say to me, Pastor, I I really feel for you. I, I, I understand. I have empathy for you. Well, that makes me feel better about my situation. But does that give me power to overcome the struggles that I'm going through? Now, later on in chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4, it it discusses the fact that that one of his qualities as our high priest is that he actually can empathize or sympathize with us. He does understand. And that, for me, as a human being, is a benefit. And I don't want to wash that away or ignore that fact. It is. And I, and I know for many of you, you've even expressed that to me. I'm, I'm thankful that I could come to Jesus, the man, and say, I know that you understand because you lived this life as a man. And I know, and that, that brings us into a, a deeper relationship with him. I don't want to wash over that, but that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the fact that, because it says, in pertaining to the things of God, this is talking about the fact that, that as Christ became a man, died for you, suffered the test, proved it out. He can now, as our great high priest, make propitiation for us. What that means is this. God doesn't have a beef with you when you're in Christ. There is no separation between me and him. I can now go right to the throne. And I could get the aid I need, the power I need, to overcome the temptations or the tests in my life. This is about the power of God to help you in your tests. Because Jesus did become a man. Because he did put on flesh. Because he passed the test. He is fit to be our savior. He is fit to be our great high priest. And he can aid you. Listen, no matter how you come to this conclusion, no matter what leads us to this point, the point of this is very, very clear. This is the point right here. Jesus is able to help you. That's the primary point. Jesus is able 
to help you go to Jesus in your time of trouble. Go to him. Go to Jesus with your sin. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus with your temptations and tests. Go to Jesus. Go to him. He's able to aid in your time of testings. Go to him. Go to Jesus when you're in the middle of a storm and being tested like you've never been tested before, go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. You want to save your neighbor. You want to see them be freed from this bondage. Jesus freed them. He, he, he's, he's done that. He, the power of Satan has been broken. Go to Jesus and beg for your neighbor's life. Go to Jesus. He is able to aid in your time of need. Hey, you can come to me and I can sympathize and empathize with you. I might even be able to give you a shred of good, you know, occasionally advice. Maybe. I might give you bad advice. I try to give you good advice, but I'm not the one who can give you power in your day of need. That is Jesus we're not supposed to do this alone, so link arms and move together in fellowship as a body of Christ. But if you are not seeking the power in Jesus, you are not going to get the aid that he has made available through the taking on of humanity, making him our perfect high priest who could be merciful and who is faithful in the things pertaining to God. Go to Jesus. Church, if you don't hear anything else this morning, and I said a lot, go to Jesus. Christianity is so much more simple than we make it. There's a lot to know, there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to grow, but almost every answer is really this. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Take it to him. Talk to him. Get close to him. S learn of, of him in his word. Learn of him through your trial. Learn of him through each other. It's about Jesus. Church, it's about Jesus. It's always been about him. It'll always be about him. It's always for him. It's always to him. It's always through him. It's about Jesus. Is that simple enough? I know I, that's deep. I'm telling you, I wrestled through those verses because like, but I'm, it's that simple. He is able to aid you in your time of testing and the time of need because of all that God has brought him through. He is now positioned as our great high priest. We will talk a lot more about that. Just know this, he can help you go to Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Father. Father.